I don't go to the coin laundromat anymore. A few months ago, I, 22, was at the local coin laundromat. I went late because I had been studying around 10 p.m. The laundromat is pretty small, closer to the edge of the beach town I live in. The town is pretty well known for drifters and people experiencing homelessness. Most people are friendly, and there is a lot of drug use, but I've never really felt scared. Everything was fine until I went to move my laundry to a dryer. I was listening to music on my headphones, but not super loudly. Suddenly, I got the feeling that someone was watching me. I can't really explain it. I just felt the presence. I turned around and there was a man standing just a few feet away from me. He was a white guy with pink hair, wearing a full face mask, like a ski mask, a hoodie, gloves, and sunglasses, even though it was dark out. The gloves and the sunglasses especially immediately made me feel uncomfortable. I thought maybe he was a drifter or high, but I didn't want to be rude. I tried to laugh it off and told him he surprised me. He immediately started talking. A lot of it was disjointed and just didn't make sense. He was talking about coming up from Brazil to bring his brother money to get a classic car. None of it made much sense. But he would ask me questions and wait for me to respond. So I tried to just play along. I still thought he was probably just high or something, but he was standing between me and the only door, and I started getting this gut feeling that he was blocking the door on purpose. Not just accidentally as he talked to me. He was getting closer to me as he talked, and the feeling got stronger. Logically, something was off, but mostly, I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that I needed to leave and keep him talking until I could. I started to edge to the side, but he stayed in front of me, and the feeling got more intense, so I started gripping my keys in attack position just in case. He talked more, and then backed off a little. He took off his backpack, which was a child's unicorn backpack, and set it on a nearby dryer. I looked over to the door for just a second, and when I looked back, he was pulling something I couldn't see out and holding it to the side, behind him where I couldn't see it. But I did see what was in the backpack, duct tape. Instantly, it was like an alarm went off, there was no more worrying about being rude, no more second guessing myself that he was just off but harmless. It was like this cold numb dread just washed over me. I almost felt calm, like I knew the next steps, knew I had to do something. Time seemed to move in slow motion. He turned back to me, not saying anything anymore, and took a step forward. I gripped my keys as tightly as possible and tried to mentally prepare to fight. I remember being afraid that I would walk too slow or be too weak, like a nightmare. But all of a sudden the door to the laundromat opened and a woman walked in, barely even looking at us as she went to get her laundry. It was like a scene in a movie, a moment of intensity just interrupted by something innocuous and suddenly, it's over. He just turned, got his bag and left. I was so scared I just stayed there for a minute until I could get my laundry and just go home. I didn't report it. I never knew what to say, since nothing had actually happened. But when I think about it, I think the scariest thing is that he left as soon as someone walked in. If he was just crazy, it wouldn't have mattered. I think a stranger's laundry timer saved me from something terrible. I don't go to the laundromat anymore. I joined the laundry service. The extra cost is worth it to never go back. So, to the man with the pink hair and the unicorn backpack, let's not meet again. The Hobbling Hitchhiker One evening, I was out in Lacey, Washington to pick up a handgun I had recently purchased for protection. Contrary to the pickup status both online and sent to my email, the store didn't have it in stock yet and told me to come back in another week. I lived about an hour from Lacey at the time, and when I had gotten there, evening rush hour was just beginning to become unbearable. I didn't want to drive all the way back home just yet as it would add an additional hour to my already long commute. Side note, the car I was driving belonged to my dad, and I was borrowing it until I had enough money saved up for a new car, after my beloved Honda had broken down the previous year. I killed some time bumming around the store I had purchased my firearm from, then decided to drive over to the nearest coffee shop. It was a newly built cabin-style cafe with a modern twist. The barista handed me my 16-ounce dirty chai, and I walked back out to my car. I then drove to a gas station around the corner, still trying to kill time until traffic thinned out. 
The car didn't need gas, so I pulled into a parking spot right at the corner of the four-way street block the gas station was on. I turned off the engine, stepped outside, and lit up a smoke, leaning against the driver's side door so as not to stink up the interior. The weather was overcast and drizzly, but not overly cold. It was now dusk, and most daylight had disappeared. The stoplights in the intersection were diffused by the late autumn mist. I watched them flicker from green, to yellow, to red, and again, as the traffic was orchestrated accordingly. Zoned out by the lights and being generally lost in thought while enjoying my coffee and smoke, I didn't notice the man walking towards me, until he was already halfway across the street. He was white, average height, and strawberry blonde, maybe in his mid-twenties. He definitely hadn't changed his clothes in a good while, and carried a backpack I assumed to be full of the few belongings he had. He didn't smell, but he looked raggedy and unkempt. My immediate thought was that drugs were likely a part of his habitual lifestyle. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but I'm always cautious having grown up in the suburbs of Seattle. The man finished crossing the street, awkwardly limping toward my car, maintaining eye contact and a winced grin. I locked my car out of caution, but remained outside smoking casually. Normally I'm not a social person, but I don't go out of my way to be unpleasant either. He approached me and stood about 10 feet away when he said, Hello, and asked if I had a light. I complied hesitantly, but saw no harm in meeting his simple requests. Taking two steps forward, I lit his cigarette which he was holding out toward me while approaching. He attempted to make small talk, weaving in hints that he had just gotten off of the bus and still needed to get down the road another block. Somewhere in this poorly crafted sob story he stopped himself mid-sentence, like a bad actor and pretended to be struck by an epiphany. Hey, would you mind just dropping me off down the road? It's not very far. I apologized and said I couldn't help because it was my dad's car and not my own, and I didn't feel comfortable without my father's permission. Some stupid yet plausible excuse I came up with on the spot. Mr. Unkempt didn't like my answer, and his smile immediately turned tense and flatlined. Clearly upset, he became more insistent. But it's just down the road, he whined. My leg is killing me, and it wouldn't even be far for you. I'll give you a cigarette. His persistence and sudden burst of hostility made my hair stand up. I firmly said, No, I'm sorry I can't help you. It's my dad's car and he has set the rules. Absolute BS. With ten years of hospitality under my belt, I immediately offered him alternate logical ideas of what he could do to get to where he needed to be. I even mentioned maybe someone in the gas station we were outside of could help him out, or call him a ride. Each word I said made him increasingly irate, and he began curling his fingers into fists. Not in a threatening way, but like a toddler about to scream bloody murder for not getting their way. He seemed to pause and size me up in a fleeting moment. I'm small, and not at all intimidating physically, so I told him I hope he makes it home safe, quickly unlocked my car, jumped in, and locked myself inside. When looking up from locking the car door, I see him speed walking back across the street from the direction he originally came from. No limp, no awkward walk whatsoever, no distress or pain showing even slightly, just the normal speed walk of a physically well person, a rageful person. I knew I had dodged the bullet, and I felt pretty dumb for hanging around the city after dark alone. At that point, I didn't even care about traffic anymore, so I turned over my engine and hightailed it home in what ended up being an hour and 45 minute drive. But this time, the traffic was 100% worth the convenience. PSA if you haven't heard it enough already. Be careful who you give your attention to, especially when you're alone. Stay aware always, and err on the side of caution, even when strangers seem harmless at first. Crazy, bad acting hitchhiker guy, I hope you got the help you needed rather than the help you wanted. And I hope we never meet again. Attacked in the park, at 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, I went to the park with a friend. At the time, there was an event on. I'm not sure what the correct word is, but it was the kind of event where there were animals you could pet, cotton candy exhibits, and exhibitions, in addition to places you can buy things. I mention all this because it's relevant later. Anyway, I buy a small plastic toy sword at one of the stalls, and me and my friend went off away from the event into the playground section of the park. 
We were playing around with my toy sword when we were approached by a group of teenagers a few years older than us. I can't remember exactly what was said at first, but they led us over to an area that had a wooden picket fence. They seemed nice at first, so we weren't scared or anything. That was until one of the guys suddenly out of nowhere grabbed us. I think there were three or four of them in total. One guy was holding each of us, and the other one to two guys were just standing back laughing. They also positioned themselves so no one could see us or what was happening. The guys started to get aggressive, and us only being ten were really scared. They started trying to force my head into the space between the picket fence, and said they were going to beat us. We tried calling out for people, but we were met with more physical violence. Luckily I still had my plastic sword and they hadn't taken it off of me. In the panic I was in, I was able to smash the hilt of my plastic sword into the neck, face or shoulder of the guy holding me. I must have smashed it hard enough to make him hurt, because he let me go, and the guy holding my friend was distracted. In that split second, me and my friend bolted away. They chased us nearly all the way back to the event, swearing at us, telling us what they were going to do with us when they caught us. Thankfully we made it back okay, and we just clung to our friend's mom for the rest of our time there. Someone broke in when I was alone at home. Hello. I have to tell you that I'm not a native English speaker, so please forgive my spelling mistakes. It happened six years ago when I was 20. So I came home after sleeping at my boyfriend's place. It was like 8 a.m. Super early because my boyfriend started his shift. My parents were already gone like an hour earlier to their holidays. So I was alone at home and I knew it. So I come home, and I went directly to my bedroom to continue my night. But before climbing the stairs, I saw that the kitchen door and window was wide open. I was surprised, but I didn't think that I was in any danger inside my own house. You have to know that my father is super paranoid, and there's no way he would have forgotten to close the windows before leaving the house for two weeks, even if I stayed. I used to sleep at my boyfriend's house most of the time. But I was barely awake, so I just closed the door. I checked the kitchen and the living room just to be sure, then got up to my room. There are three rooms on the second floor. I went to my room, changed, then I went to the bathroom to get back to my room. I did close the door to my room, and I don't know why, because I never usually did. I was scrolling on my phone, and like five minutes later, I heard her footstep right behind my door. Someone was there, the whole time, while I was living my life vulnerably. I was terrified. My heart stopped and I couldn't move. I just took the first thing in front of me to defend myself. I stared at the door, waiting for the person to open up and kill me, or worse. I was ready to jump out of the window and die if I had to see that door open. Minutes passed and I heard the person on the stairs. I don't know how long I stayed there, immobile, but eventually I did call my boyfriend and he came to rescue me. At first I thought I was crazy because I didn't actually see anything. And I couldn't believe that it really happened. But my boyfriend confirmed they forced the door and windows on the kitchen, so they were really here. They were silently waiting for me to sleep to get out of my house. I was home alone, feeling safe, but I was not. It was traumatic. I can barely stay alone somewhere without freaking out today. I live alone, and I'm constantly afraid of someone trying to break in. But the worst part is they didn't take anything. My mom's MacBook and jewelry my PlayStation 4, my dad's gaming setup. Everything was so easy to take, but they didn't. I can't stop thinking that they're here for a different reason. You also have to know that, at that time, I was very active on Snapchat. I used to post every day. I used to tell and put in my story every part of my day. So the 5K of unknown followers that I had on social media knew everything about me at this time. And I think it might have been related. Since then, I've stopped my activities on Snapchat. Do you think it's related, or did I just interrupt them? He stared at me from his car for almost three hours. I, 29F, used to do some street performing when I was low on money, and at the time of this story, I was 25. I had recently lost a lot of weight and needed to save money for skin removal surgery in addition to buying all new clothing and seeing a chiropractor because of the changes in my gait affecting my spine. Pro tip, 
Losing weight is expensive as fuck. I don't know why nobody warns you about that. So this was a Friday night, and I was in a college town near the state university with a lot of bars and restaurants. Because all my clothes hung off my body like a tablecloth, I was wearing a decorative scarf tied into a dress, and it was a little on the revealing side, but didn't look as sloppy as the rest of my clothing. If you don't wear decent clothing and makeup and such when you street perform, people assume you're homeless and can be really shitty towards you. This is relevant to the story. So, I was tuning up my guitar, sitting in a camping chair outside of a couple of bars, and at around 8.30, this beige SUV pulls up and parks in front of me. The guy driving it hopped out and approached me. Hey, do you want something to eat? Nah, I'm okay. Thanks, though. Okay. And he got back into his car. But instead of driving away, he just sat there, staring at me. I thought it was a little bit strange at the time, but I was focused on getting warmed up, so I didn't initially worry about it too much. I was only planning on staying out until about midnight, so I wanted to maximize my time. It was the end of dinner time, and beginning of the bar time rush, so it took me a while to realize that the beige SUV was still there, and the guy was still sitting in the driver's seat, looking at me. I'm pretty sure he didn't even pay the parking meter. At about 9.30, he hops out again. Hey, are you hungry yet? No, I'm okay. I ate before I came here. Come on, I wanted to give you something, but I don't have any cash. Let me buy you dinner. This does happen. When somebody who doesn't carry cash sees a street musician that they like, they will often offer to buy a snack and bring it to you. So I didn't find that strange. Okay, sure. If you want to bring me a snack, that's cool. Okay, come with me. Um, no. I'm not leaving my spot here. There's a really good restaurant I want to take you to, but it's too far to walk. We need to drive there. Sorry, I'm not really interested in going somewhere. I need to stay here and make some money tonight. I thought you were hungry. Come on, let me buy you dinner. Starting to get frustrated. No, I told you I'm not actually that hungry. If you wanted to tip me with something other than cash, a slice of pizza from the place across the street, or a soda, or a cigarette. That I'm fine with, but I'm not leaving my spot. No, I'm not going to buy you a slice of pizza. If you want to eat dinner, you need to come with me. At this point, tons of people were walking past us, and I was getting really annoyed at him for keeping me from playing music. Well, I'm not going anywhere, and I need to make some money tonight, so I'm done talking about this. At that point, I started playing my guitar to show him that I was done with this conversation. I probably should have been more concerned by this point, but I was honestly just pissed off. It wasn't that uncommon for men who saw me street performing to offer me food or shelter in exchange for sex, so I kind of assumed that's what he was after at that point. For about the next hour, I focused on just playing music and chatting with people, and it was actually a pretty productive night. I had almost forgotten about the creepy dude until he got out of his car and leaned against the door, still staring at me. By now it was almost 11 p.m., and it dawned on me that he had been here for over two hours. That's when the alarm bells finally started to go off in my head. I had a hard time focusing on music after that, because he was just standing there. And the longer it lasted, the more it felt like he had something more nefarious than just trying to bribe a young homeless woman to sleep with him in mind. At about 11.30, I realized I needed to do something sooner rather than later. It was pretty much peak bar hour, but the streets were going to become less crowded eventually, and I was going to be walking home. I didn't want to risk him following me. Now when I'm street performing, I'm in friendly mode, and I'm not the most intimidating looking girl in general, so I don't think he was expecting me to confront him directly. But when I feel threatened, I tend to get pretty mad pretty fast. Figuring I had plenty of witnesses, I walked right up to him, angry as hell by this point. Why are you staring at me? Him taken aback. Huh? You've been staring at me for three hours now. Do you just like making younger women uncomfortable? I was mad, talking progressively faster and louder, and it was very clear this wasn't going the way he expected it to. No, no, no. I just want to buy you dinner. So you're just waiting for me to get hungry enough to go get dinner with you, when I've already said no several times? That's not being helpful. 
It's being creepy. I know there aren't any restaurants that are still open at 11.30 p.m. around here. No, no, this one is. It's still open. I don't care if it's still open because I don't want to go anywhere with you. I told you that. Why are you still here waiting? No, you don't understand. He looked like he was racking his brain for an excuse. What? What am I not understanding about you staring at me for the last three hours? No, you see, I'm an Uber driver. Of all the stupid excuses he could have picked, this was probably the stupidest. Me pretending to understand. Oh, okay, I get it. You've been waiting all this time for someone who ordered an Uber. Him smiling. Yes, yes. And you were just going to leave them waiting while you took me to a restaurant then. What happened next freaked me out more than anything else that night. As soon as I blew a hole through his piss poor cover story, it was like he took off a mask. His smile disappeared, and his voice was deadly serious as he climbed back into his car and said to me, Okay, you will never see my face again. And he drove off. Fast. I just stood there in shock. I had had plenty of creepy encounters while street performing, but not like this. It was impossible to convince myself that he was going to do anything besides abduct me. I was done after that. I decided to order an actual Uber home instead of walking, which cost about half of what I'd made in tips that night. In the back of the Uber, counting my cash, I realized that it was time to retire. The small amount of money I made during the daytime was not worth the effort, and the decent money I made at night was not worth the risk. I've since moved on to a new side hustle, and also developed agoraphobia because of this, and other incidents like it. I hate leaving the house alone. I order most of my groceries and household supplies through DoorDash, and I have a job that's only three blocks away from my apartment. Still, on my walks to and from work, I find myself consistently checking my surroundings and using the reflection in storefront windows to make sure I'm not being followed. So, creepy guy in the beige SUV, I hope you keep your promise and that I never see your face again. Amanda, the ex-girlfriend of my best friend who nearly destroyed my life. Okay, this may be a long story, but I'm ready to tell the people of Reddit my story of Let's Not Meets. This first started when I was in my first year of sixth form. My friend, let's say her name was Candle, she introduced me to her friend. Let's call her Amanda. I used to chat with Amanda every day for like two weeks simply because she used to message me constantly. She seemed like a nice girl at first, until she started to make me feel uncomfortable around her, as she used to message me, I want to cuddle you, like a big teddy bear, and similar things to that, and I shot it down, but she got upset and threatened to call the police on me if I didn't go on a date with her, I'm a gay guy by the way, but I wasn't out of the closet at this point in my life, I screenshotted everything she said to me and I showed my friend Candle, and she said, yeah I believe you, she's a compulsive liar. She lied about a teacher essaying her, and used to make things up to make her sound better than everyone else. I was so glad Candle believed me, and advised me to block Amanda, which I did. Fast forward two years later, I was now in college and I encountered her again. I didn't recognize her and was chatting to her without realizing she was the same Amanda from two years prior. That was until I messaged Candle on Facebook, as Amanda told me she knew Candle. Candle sent me a long paragraph. Um... You do realize that's Amanda, right? Then, it all came flooding back to me. She's right. It's the same girl who threatened to call the police on me for not going on a date with her. She was dating a friend of mine in college. I tried to warn him, but he didn't listen to me. Amanda claimed to have a crush on me a second time, and I shot it down right away, telling her I'm not interested. She obviously took offense to that and threatened to call the police again, to which I replied, what's the police gonna do? This isn't a police matter. Which, by her facial expression, angered her more. But she just walked off. The next couple of weeks go by. I ended up telling my friend about what she'd been messaging me with. And he obviously believed me as he saw her messaging me in real time. She kept asking me on a date and saying she liked me since day one. But here's the thing. She was in a relationship with my friend. Naturally, my friend got upset 
and called her in front of me, where she claimed she had no clue what he was talking about and told him I'm making up lies. Then he forgave her, after she admitted it was true just a week later. To my annoyance, she began hanging out with us. I was nice to her because I didn't want my friend to get upset. She tried telling me she had two children at 17, with one being 13 and one being 3 years old. I thought that's odd. How is she 17 and having a 13 year old child? She would have been 4. Something wasn't adding up. She stated she was essayed when she was young. I should have called her out but my friend was there and I didn't want to upset him. She even stated that the 3 year old child was my friend's daughter. Even he looked confused like it was the first time he had ever heard of this child. When she went home, I asked him. He hesitated. No idea. She never mentioned the child before now. And we definitely never had sex. Very strange. Fast forward to a year I was working in a shop. She suddenly showed up and asked to speak to me. My manager let me go on my 30 minute lunch. She was with her friend and she wanted to tell me that my best friend was manipulating her and always hurting her which I knew for a fact wasn't true. Marcus wouldn't hurt a fly, but I listened to whatever else she wanted to say. She said she was trapped in a relationship with him and felt scared of him. No idea why she was telling me this knowing I don't like her. I just made out that I believed her and headed back to work. I came home and FaceTimed Marcus to tell him everything she had told me earlier that day. He started crying his eyes out because he found out she had cheated on him with another guy. A friend of his showed him a picture as proof and forwarded it to me. It was definitely a picture of her with some guy kissing on a bus. I told Marcus he needs to get away from her ASAP, which he did, until the next day when they were back together, as he yet again forgave her. We started doing group video chats, me, Marcus, and Amanda at her request, and remember her three-year-old from a year prior? Well now, she was a five-year-old called Lily, and I asked her about the 13-year-old she mentioned, where she replied with, I don't have a child other than Lily. The next couple of months go by, and she used to say, Lily's in bed or Lily's at school, etc. But when I call her out, she used to show us Lily by turning the camera to a pitch black area of her bedroom and quickly put the camera back to her. I thought this was odd and said, why do you move the camera so fast? We didn't see anything. She then replied, because she's camera shy or she's asleep. I couldn't take it anymore. It was excuse after excuse. If Lily was Marcus's daughter, he deserves to see her as he literally never met or saw Lily, not even once. I sent her a long message stating that Lily does not exist, and why are there no pictures of her? Then I blocked her, because I have had enough of her playing games with my best friend. She then went onto people's Facebooks and I kid you not, she took random photos of random people's children and claimed them as Lily. Me and Marcus looked at each other and knew these were different pictures of random kids. Some of them weren't even girls. This went on until one day me and Marcus went to Amanda's mother's workplace and Marcus showed her all of the messages especially the ones about this Lily and the many pictures of her and random guys she meets up with. We found her on dating websites asking for men to fatten her up. We showed everything to Amanda's mother and she was furious. She said Amanda had never had kids and she was never essayed as a child. She knew something was odd as she got into some random man's car just the other day before. I thought this was the end of Amanda. But I couldn't be more wrong as Marcus like an idiot met up with her that evening and forgave her for the millionth time. And then something strange happened the next day. Marcus called me on FaceTime and he was furious. At me. I asked him what was going on and what did I do. He told me that I was a bad friend and that he wanted to cut me out of his life. I was in shock and I heard Amanda laughing in the background. Then it clicked. She said something about me which wasn't true. And now me and Marcus were arguing like crazy. He blocked me on everything which broke my heart as this boy was my best friend. And now he's believing his compulsive lying girlfriend over me? Me and Marcus were having on and off arguments all the time. And Amanda was the root of it. Telling him lies and manipulating him like she was jealous of our friendship. Maybe she thought I was a threat to her relationship with Marcus. And tried to split us up as best friends. She literally used to invite me out with them. And when I turn up, she used to be like, I wanted to spend time with you. Why is he here? Excuse me? You're the one who invited me. This happened every single time until one time I snapped back at her, which made her cry but I didn't care. She needed to stop doing this to me as it wasn't healthy for my mental health. A few weeks go by and Marcus was texting me on Facebook Messenger. We were having a laugh like we used to. 
He went to the toilet as he was with Amanda. Then I finally got a text from Marcus, saying, Hi, it's Amanda. I replied with, Hey. And she started sending me threatening messages saying that I need to leave Marcus alone, and he doesn't like me and I need to move on. I was like, what the fuck? I ended up arguing with her over this, asking why the hell she was using his phone sending me these messages. Amanda was like, I dare you to come say it to my face. And at that point, I had had enough. I contacted a friend of mine, let's call her Jasmine, and told her the situation. I ended up in tears on the phone. I've known Jasmine since primary school and we had been close friends since, so she naturally got defensive and asked me to get in the car, that she'll drop me off there so I can say it to her face. Jasmine wanted to hurt Amanda for what she had done to me. We saw them and confronted them. Marcus genuinely had no clue what was going on until I showed him the messages Amanda sent from his phone. He was furious and walked off in tears as I ran after him leaving Amanda and Jasmine alone. Me and Marcus hugged it out and we had to talk about what had happened. He was telling me that he isn't allowed to be friends anymore, and Amanda made him choose between her and his family, which made me furious even more. I had enough of the way she was treating my best friend. The next day, Jasmine messaged me and said she can't be friends with me anymore, as I was bullying Amanda for months, which wasn't true. I would never bully anyone. I said to Jasmine if she was my real friend, she would know that Amanda was lying, but obviously not. To this very day, I never saw Jasmine again. This felt like a big betrayal of our friendship, and I would never talk to Jasmine ever again. This was over six years ago now. Me and Marcus were getting on better, and he wasn't letting Amanda manipulate him anymore. That was until these boys came into our lives. Well, first there was another girl I was friends with called Alice. I had known Alice for years and I invited her out with me and Marcus to a pub for a few drinks. It was a nice evening, and Alice even called Amanda and told her that she needs to leave Marcus alone. That evening when we were saying goodbye, as I was naturally worried for Marcus as he's like a little brother to me at this point, Alex asked if I was gay, which I am gay but I wasn't out of the closet yet so I responded with no, and Alice said, then why you worry about Marcus, you obviously fancy him. Well no, he's like a brother to me and we have been through a lot because of Amanda, so I obviously do care about him. I thought to forget about this as I assumed she was just making conversation. Then Alice messaged Marcus asking him out on a date. And by the end of that week, they started dating. I was happy that he was moving on from Amanda, but boy was I wrong. I started receiving messages from Alice's brother and his friends stating that they were going to slice my throat and were messaging Marcus to help them beat me up. We were talked into joining a group video call and the call contained me, Marcus, Amanda, Alice's brother and his friends saying horrible things towards me saying that I should die and I hurt women which wasn't true. It was more of Amanda's lies and I was messaging Marcus to back me up because he was quiet while I'm trying to defend myself against these guys. He just read my messages and still sat there, not saying anything. At this point I had had enough. I left the call and left the group. Then I blocked the lot of them apart from Marcus. Marcus called me the next morning saying sorry for not defending me, which I replied with, well, that isn't good enough. They were literally threatening me. Marcus went quiet and said sorry again. By that point, I had ended the call because I couldn't be bothered with this stress anymore. Next thing I know, Alice was denying that she ever dated Marcus and claimed that I had made a fake account of her on the messaging app. Are you serious, mate? I also noticed Alice was being besties with Amanda on Facebook. So that's the puzzle fitting. At this point, I wanted to end it all. I was at my lowest. I was losing all my friends because of this Amanda. This was the start of my depression, getting worse and worse. Me and Marcus eventually made up and we were best friends again, but there was a period where we didn't talk for over a year. I guess that's me trying to move on with my life. But we eventually started talking again and me and Marcus met up, just the two of us, and he was saying how sorry he was for everything he had done. I said it's okay. He was under Amanda's control. Fast forward to 2024. Marcus has a new fiance who is a lovely girl, and I'm going to be the best man at his wedding because I stopped him from jumping every time Amanda cheated on him. I was always there for him. He now sees that I was there for him, and we're closer than ever. He even defends me a lot more nowadays, and always has my back. I've seen Amanda here and there a few times, but I don't even acknowledge her, or them, as Amanda is non-binary, which I don't believe as it could be another lie for attention, but I'm not judging. If that's how they feel, then that's up to them but that doesn't change the person who nearly destroyed my life. Last time I saw Amanda last year was at Pride. They were pointing at me showing their current boyfriend who I am. 
I didn't notice until my other best friend, not Marcus, pointed it out to me. That was the last time I ever saw them, and hopefully, never again. There's a lot I missed on this story, as it happened over a couple of years, but I just want to say, Amanda, let's not meet, ever, again. <laughs>